you know, this interest in Sri Lankan food and being able to explain it to people and go, look at this and then have people respond positively and go, oh, wow, it's really different to anything I've had or it's really delicious. Like that's, you know, that's quite a privilege to be able to show people something that they've never had before and for them to enjoy it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The food of the subcontinent offers the most extraordinary spice trail with influences from all corners using stunning ingredients and techniques that could take a lifetime to explore in detail. Sri Lanka has a fascinating history and cuisine, as intricate and varied as it is vibrant and colourful. But with so many influences, what is Sri Lankan cuisine? Tama Carey is a chef and owner of Lankan Filling Station in Sydney, Tama, how are you? I am very good, thank you. It's great to have you on the show. You've uh, t- you took Sydney by storm with Lankan Filling Station. Firstly, the the word that it was opening, and then when it did open, it was hard to get in. W- what's it been like um, delving into sort of the food of of your family's cultural sort of background like this? It's been it's been amazing. Um, very different to anything I've done before. I had never, before I opened Lankan Filling Station, I'd never actually um, cooked Sri Lankan professionally. I hadn't, hadn't actually really cooked Sri Lankan very much. I'd kind of, you know, my mum cooked it really well, not all the time. I didn't grow up eating it every day or anything. It was, you know, it was there, but it wasn't like what we ate on a daily basis. Um, but I've spent a lot of time in Sri Lanka and... You know, obviously having Sri Lankan food around, but I'd never really cooked it myself. And then I decided I needed a Sri Lankan restaurant because I decided the people needed to eat more Sri Lankan food. And so I had to very quickly teach myself how to do it. Well, uh, I think a lot of people did, and thank God you did, because it was extraordinary what you did create. What what was it like for you delving into um, different recipes and um, and techniques and and immersing yourself in that world leading up to the opening? Um, I was so interestingly, you know, I kind of felt a little bit. I've always felt that the Sri Lankan food stuff for me was a bit removed in terms of I was a chef or I am a chef. And, you know, I've cooked all sorts of different things, but the Sri Lanka food was kind of separate to that. Um, But then once I started, once I went, okay, right, this is what I'm doing, it was like, obviously, you know, I've been learning it for the last 20 years subconsciously, basically. So it was quite an easy, you know, it was an easy thing to do from that because I just realised I had, you know, I'd been travelling there for years and years and learning the food and bothering people about the recipes and, you know, I'd been eating that food. So I had all of this knowledge that it kind of all clicked into place quite nicely. Well, take us back to when you were young. I know professionally you've cooked so many different different cuisines which we can get into, but take us back to when you were young. What what sort of role did food play in your family? Uh, I was one of those lucky ones who kind of grew up being surrounded by good food and people who wanted to eat food and, you know, families of very excellent cooks. So, um, but interestingly, I did not eat as a child. I refused to eat, was very uninterested in food. Um, yeah, didn't care for food. Didn't, couldn't go into butchers, like up until about the age of 15 or 16. I refused to go into a butcher or a fish shop because I thought that was stinky. Um, even though at the time I was working at the Adelaide Central Markets. So I kind of had, you know, this immersive food stuff going on, but at the, at the same time I kind of didn't really care for food. Mum said trying to feed me as a child was horrible. We, um, we actually spent I think about six months when I was about two-ish in Sri Lanka. Mum went there for a big long stint and I was there with her for a while and I ate nothing but rice and papadums and bananas. That was all I'd eat. Yeah. So I didn't. And then it was like the food for me, I kind of, even though I was surrounded by it all and, you know, interesting things, not just 
like mum, you know, we ate a lot of, we ate food from all over the place. And, you know, there's lots of good Greek food in Adelaide. We always went to Asian restaurants where I would just hide under the table and ignore what was going on. But so I had like the knowledge around me, but I just didn't eat really. Well, when was it, when was the turning point? When, when did food become of interest to you? I think it was, it was kind of a gradual thing. There was a few moments. So when I was about 10, um, my best mate at the time in Adelaide, we came to Sydney because her dad lived here, her dad and her dad's partner, and that was Barry Ross and Philip Sell, and we stayed, They had it was when they had Oasis Ceros <laughs> on Oxford Street, and so we stayed you know, that's where they lived, so that was where we were staying. Um, and I remember really distinctly going into the call room of the restaurant because they didn't have a kitchen upstairs, so we just ate from the, the call room of the restaurant when we weren't going out. And I remember just looking at this call room going, oh, my God, that is amazing. Um, and then and the other big, I think one of the other moments was when I was 14 or 15, 14, I started working at the Central Markets in Adelaide and I worked at a stall called Provador, which is still there but very different to what it used to be. And it was kind of a gourmet food stall. I remember we, um, the first day I worked looking into the freezer and there were these whole skinned possums that we used to get for Chong Lu. Um, and so very rapidly, and we and they used to make beautiful stuff themselves Provador had their own brand and they made pâtés and olives and we had fresh pasta, there were beautiful cakes, um, truffles, bread. They kind of gourmet my food shop. Anyway, so I started working there and I think that was probably a big um, influence. But we used to go to the markets every Saturday. That was how I got the job because my mum bribed the owner with, I think, free theatre tickets and said, give my daughter a job, would you? Um and so, yeah, it was around that time that I kind of, I think it was all those things influenced it. Well, it's extraordinary for someone that didn't have an interest at all in f- food to create a career in food and such a successful one. What, what was the first step into the industry for you? It was purely by accident. It was a big mistake. It was, um, <laughs> I had no, you know, no leanings towards it. Um, and then I went travelling like you do when you finish school um, with no idea what I wanted to do. I think I still wanted to be an actress at that stage of my life. Um, and I arrived in – so that that was really important. So I travelled from Australia to Sri Lanka and I went with my mum and a friend of mine. And that was – since I was a baby, that was the first time I'd been there – um, and we had a good six weeks there. Um, and it was amazing traveling around with my mum. You know, we saw family, we saw friends. I saw where she grew up. Um, I ate so much food. My mum was shocked. She was like, I've never seen you eat so much food ever. Um, and that trip was really significant. I mean, it was just incredible. You know, it's such a beautiful place. And I felt really comfortable there as well. It felt you know, familiar in a way and comfortable and I just loved it. Um, And then from there I went on my own to London um, and the plan was to keep travelling and I wanted to go up to Spain and travel around but, of course, I had um, no money even though I'd been planning this for ages. Um, I had some but not very much so I knew I needed to get a job in London. Um, And through a family friend who's one of my great friends, her partner used to be a sh- or is a chef. Her ex-partner was a chef. Anyway, so she knew some people in the industry. Um, and down the road from where she lived, there was a woman who had a restaurant and she contacted her very roundabout way. I thought I was getting a job as a kitchen hand, but it was in the kitchen. And then that was it. And then I stayed. And it was it was crazy. And I didn't go. Never made it to Spain that trip. <laughs> When you came back to Australia, how different was it to the experiences you had over there in regards to food and, and immersing yourself in this industry here? 
Well, I mean, in when I was in London, I was just a bit of a, like, I wasn't, I was really young um, and it wasn't a career for me. So I was, I was just fun and it was pretty outrageous. So I wasn't, it wasn't a serious thing for me. But what I did was really aware of being in London was um, the knowledge that I had about food and about Asian food, but just about food in general because it was pretty, like, London food scene wasn't, it was a bit bleak back then, really. Like, there was a lot of stuff um, that wasn't around. You know, Australia had especially with the Asian stuff, you know, Australia was miles ahead in terms of what we were doing. I mean, I remember t- telling the chef, talking to her, like saying I felt like Luxor or something, and she was like, what's Luxor? I was like, are you joking? What, what is this world that I'm living in? And then we put it on, and I explained it to her, and she was like, put it on the menu. And I, and I had to bring up my mum and go, mum, how do I cook Luxor? I don't know. Because I'd never cooked it before, of course. Um, so that was really interesting the I suppose I like looking back I must have you know for me I just kind of fell into this job and I was just doing it but looking back I probably obviously was good at it then um because otherwise I would have got sacked but I was good at it and I think I had a lot of food knowledge just from osmosis just from you know life because I had this life that was all about food without really knowing it, knowing any different. You've worked at some extraordinary uh, restaurants in Australia, very different cuisines as well, with the French at Bistro Moncur, um, Billy Kwong, um, and Italian as well with Berta. Um, what did you get out of those cuisines and experiences? Uh, well, also, I mean, every, every, each of those jobs was really distinct for me and really, like, fundamental to my learning because I mean I never went to TAFE so I didn't have any formal training at all um and so when I ended up back in Australia um and eventually in the kitchen at Bistro Monka I mean one of the things that kitchen taught me was you know how to be in a formal kitchen because where I where I was in London was pretty loose um and so you know Bistro Monka was amazing for the food then was just so delicious and it taught me how to be in a kitchen. It taught me, you know, the fundamentals of French cuisine, which I think is really important to learn and to know. Um, And there are flavours from there, from my time there, which I can still taste and which I still refer back to, like such strong um, flavour memories. And I use, you know, there's still recipes from there that I use versions of that have kind of I've folded into my repertoire of stuff. So that was really important. Um, and then Billy Kwong was um, Billy Kwong was where I really decided that I wanted to be a chef and that I loved restaurants, you know, because I'd, I'd fallen into this thing. And obviously I've showed some aptitude to it but it wasn't until I was there that I went oh yeah this is really what I want to do and that was all about you know it was about the produce it was about the way the restaurant was run it was about the people it was about all of it really it it had an incredible alumni from from Billy Kwong but what was it like working with Kylie oh Kylie's amazing and she's very she's very passionate which is just an incredible thing to witness and, you know, in terms of ingredients and produce and and loving, you know, loving her job and it being this home for her and her friends and her staff and, you know, producing this amazing food. And what she was doing at that time was pretty incredible when you look around at what, you know, has come after that in terms of, you know, people cooking that kind of, you know, doing that Asian thing or food from your culture but doing it in a way which is very Australian as well. Do you have any stories from your time at Billy Kwong? There's just so many incredible chefs have come out of that tiny 
that tiny little um, establishment. Yeah, there was, I mean, look, it was amazing. I was there for nearly five years um, and, you know, the people who I worked with there, a lot of them are still some of my closest friends. I mean, Matthew Moo, he's my partner and that was where we first met and that was, you know, almost 20 years ago now. So it was a really excellent group of people. Um, You know, obviously there were pigs and troughs over five years but there were moments there where there was just so much talent in that kitchen and it was just it was a joy to come to work and it was it was so much fun like you know being that busy and cooking delicious food and using beautiful produce it's kind of the peak of what you really aim for I suppose in a restaurant and we we were there for it and it was amazing Tell us about Berto, the transition from cooking um, Chinese food to an interpretation of Italian cuisine down a little laneway hidden away in the city. Um, Berto was was amazing, but what was it like for you as as a head chef for the first time? Um, It was really good. I mean, so I left uh, left Billy Kwong and kind of didn't have anything lined up. So I had a couple of years out in the wild where I was just – you know, helping out and doing some consulting and doing some parties and just doing bits and pieces. And one of the bits and pieces that I was doing was um, I started doing a few shifts at Vini, which was Andrew's first restaurant because um, I used to go there for lunch and I lived around the corner and I remember having a chat to him one day because I knew him because he, funnily enough, did a trial at Billy Kwong when he first got back from Italy before Vini. And so that's how I'd met him. Um, and we'd offered him the job, but he was like, no, which was lucky because he went off and opened Vini. Um, so I kind of knew, I didn't know him that well, but I knew him enough and I was telling him my problems, like freaking out, like how I was going to pay my rent. And he kind of said to me, we can give you two shifts here a week um, if you like. And that was great because for me, just those two shifts gave me enough security to know I could pay my rent every week because I was living on my own. Um, And, you know, so that made it all a little bit easier. So I started doing bits and pieces there. Of course he pulled me in and I ended up, you know, I think Dan went away on holidays who was the head chef and I ended up having to work there for six weeks and um, I kind of got more and more sucked in. But then it was when he was looking at the Berta site and thinking of opening another restaurant um, and so a couple of years in, he kind of said before, so I'd been hanging around Beanie for a bit and then he, um, told everyone that he was going to ask me if I wanted to run it, but he didn't ask me. So when he eventually got around to asking me, which is just a bit of a chibi thing to do, um, I was like, yeah, sure, <laughs> I'll do it. And he's like, it has to be Italian. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, me of course going, yeah, of course I can do that. Fine. How hard can it be? Um, but for me, Berta was just amazing in terms of um, cooking my own food and being the boss and just being able to cook whatever I wanted. And it was, you know, I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I read so many Italian books, cookbooks. I just, we went, I was lucky enough to go to Italy a couple of times with Andrew on wine, wine buying things. Um, so it was pretty full on and we did the sagra dinners which were the once a week we would um each week there was a new ingredient and i'd base a whole dinner around that so three or four antipasti a mid course supreme usually a pasta main course and a dessert and they were quite ridiculous and i did a new one every week and i changed the menu every week um and so it was just a roller coaster of just being completely absorbed into a into a um, restaurant and not being able to leave and not being able to do anything except constantly write menus, which was um, in terms of, you know, l- creativity was incredible because I was forced into it. I just had to come up with new ideas all the time, which is incredible, but it did burn me out a little bit by the end. You're now absorbed in the world of uh, Sri Lankan food and you even have a book out as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> tell tell us a bit about 
Sri Lankan food from your perspective? I know it's hard to encapsulate in, you know, in a podcast, but um, take us on a bit of a, a dive into the way that you see Sri Lankan food. Well, so, I mean, growing up for me, the Sri Lankan food that I was eating was, oh, uh, look, there's this whole question of authenticity which gets bandied around and, you know, I like my nan was a really amazing Sri Lankan cook, but she, her Sri Lankan cooking was obviously she grew up there and lived there. They, they left in the seventies. Um, she had servants to cook a lot. I think she did cook, but you know, she wasn't doing everyday cooking. But then when she came to Australia, she was suddenly had to feed a family of five people. So her, and they, they weren't at the time, they weren't allowed to bring, very much money over. I think the white Australia nonsense. Don't know what happened. Not much money. So they weren't um, they weren't poor, but they weren't really well off. So her Sri Lankan food that I knew growing up and tasting was this. It was very Sri Lankan traditional, but it was with what you could buy in Australia in the seventies, which was probably a bit grim. Um, and also, you know, feeding a family of five on not very much money. So I think that, you know, that gets obviously wound into the ingredients you use and the style of cooking you do. And then my mum's Sri Lankan cooking was, um, you know, based on her childhood memories as well. So I had that and then I had, you know, travelling to Sri Lanka and tasting the food there. So there's all these... You know, just in my Sri Lankan world, there's a lot of different influences, but then you look at the country as a whole and historically you look at all the influences they've had and they've had they've had the Dutch, they've had the Portuguese, they've had English, there's heaps of Chinese food there. I've got a great theory about Sri Lankan food being like Thai food in terms of balance um, and flavour, you know, the freshness of Thai cuisine. But there's so much there and that's part of the reason why I wrote the book because I think, well, you, why would you know that? No one would know that because why would you? You just, you know, people want to know what Sri Lankan food is but it's really hard to capture that easily because there's so much, so many influences. You know, obviously it started in India but then it's been layered upon layer upon layer and it's this really distinct, for this tiny island, there's a really distinct flavour profile and cuisine and style that you don't get anywhere else. I suppose that's true for any country, but um, but we're talking about Sri Lanka, so we can just talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a bit about Lankan Filling Station. Can you, can you talk about the food or a dish or two that kind of exemplifies sort of what you – what you're what you're doing there um so the first idea so it started life as just a hopper shop a really simple hopper shop because hoppers are they were one of my favorite things in sri lanka um and they're um so they're the bowl shaped fermented rice flour pancake you make them in a hopper pan and they're really beautiful lacy they've got crispy edges they've got a doughy middle um you can have egg ones or plain ones the egg ones are just the same. It's just got an egg cooked in the base of it. Uh, and when you're in Sri Lanka there, you either have them for breakfast or for dinner. They're kind of a bit of a street food. Like They'll have hopper stalls on the side of the road where you can buy a pile of hoppers and take them home and eat them with curries that you've cooked at home. Um, everyone's got a different recipe for them. Everyone searches for the best hopper. People have very, are very opinionated about hoppers. Some people like the crunchy, crispy outer bits. Some people like the doughy middle bits. Um, they can be really delicate. They can be a little bit denser. Um, and traditionally, you know, more often than not, you eat them just with sand bowls. Like a, if you go out, you stop at a hopper stall and they'll have hoppers and cut a sand bowl, like one sand bowl and that will be what you eat. And you just eat, you know, you'll start with an egg hopper, then you'll just eat plain hoppers, and you'll just keep going. Um, and that was what I based, that was the centre of Lunken Filling Station. But then, of course, it grew into a restaurant because I needed to have martinis on the menu and all the curries. And 
stuff. So it is, you know, the food is all based on family recipes and recipes I've learnt over there. Um, in terms of technique, it's probably more, you know, based on my knowledge of cooking. So it's a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, we're pretty traditional. And I just wanted to, you know, showcase. It's only like a tiny bit of Sri Lankan food. No, there's so much more, but we're just trying to show a, an array of some of the things you can have there. But then, you know, using Australian ingredients and slightly different techniques because we're a restaurant in Australia. Lunken Filling Station opened before the pandemic, but um, it's been a crazy couple of years for so many people. Um, what sort of what sort of impact has it had on you? Well, same for everyone, I think. It's been pretty full on. I mean, we were only open for just over a year before it happened. So anyone who's opened a restaurant knows that, you know, that's not enough time to to get your feet firmly on the ground it's you know that first six months is always crazy and then by that year period you're just slowly beginning to understand it and then suddenly a pandemic hit and you know it was bewildering for everyone I think especially that first bit that happened um was very uncertain um and pretty scary and it's amazing how quickly a restaurant can go from having some money in the bank to just going, oh, my God, what do I do? Like, it's pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, it's been the pandemic, you know, it's thrown everyone, I think. And I think especially for restaurants um, or for me, in, I don't know, for everyone, but that whole thing about having a restaurant is the vibrancy and the moving forward and there's a certain energy in a restaurant that's very, um, you know, it's, you move forward, it's, it's exciting, it's noisy, there's people, it's always changing. And the thing that I've, that's got me this last, this last kind of batch is that stagnation and not being able to move forward. Like even things like not being able to put specials on every night or changing the menu, and all of that stuff we kind of had to pull back on because we had to pull back on everything because otherwise we wouldn't survive. Like you can't put a special on when you've got 40 people in the restaurant and two people are going to order it and then you just throw the rest of it out. Like, you you know, there's practical business things that you have to pull back on to survive, but they're the kind of things that are make the restaurant exciting, you know. So, so yeah, it was tricky, but we survived so far. Touch wood. What's the, what sort of impact has the last couple of years had on you personally? Has there been um, challenges and a different perspective on, on sort of what you do and, and life? Yeah, so, I mean, it's been a very full-on year, a couple of years. So we – there was a pandemic, which was pretty exciting, and my partner has restaurants as well. So <laughs> there were lots of restaurants to worry about. So we spent a lot of time on the phone. Um there was the book, you know, that was really big, writing the book. Um, you know, that takes a lot of time and energy. Um, and then we were also pregnant and we um, really sadly had a stillbirth at 38 weeks. So, you know, there was all the excitement of, you know, having a baby and getting the restaurants ready for us to not be there and then at not working and then all of that grief which happens and is still happening, um, which is really tricky to deal with. So, yeah, the last couple of years have been pretty full on. But but not, I mean, it's still been amazing. Like there's still been lots of amazing things. But it has been hard and continues to be hard in amongst it all. What's given you um, strength and helped through this period of time? Uh, Moo, Matthew, my partner, um, he's been really amazing. My staff have been incredible, um, you know, through all of it, through like pandemic and through this kind of grieving period, they've just been fantastic. 
when the pandemic happened, um, you know, and there was all that uncertainty and then we had to come back and then we had to, you know, keep changing and it'll be like, okay, this week we can have 10 people, we're doing takeaway, we're changing what we do, let's put stuff in jars, you know, and everything, every step of the way, whatever I kind of said to them, they were like, yep, we'll do it, yep, we're happy to do it, yep, we just want to be working, you know, so that was, that just made it, you know, because you, when you run a business, there's all these people you're really responsible for in terms of, you know, you want to keep the business alive, but, you know, a big part of it is also wanting to make sure you have staff, which we don't have at the moment. If anyone's listening and wants a job, uh, please call me. Um, but you want, you know, you're responsible for people's lives. And, you know, they were very positive. Um, and I can imagine it would be much harder if you were dealing with people who didn't really want to come to work. Um, so that was incredible. And then when, um, when my baby died, they were, they were also really, you know, amazing and helpful and just kind of just, I just felt really supported by them. One of the amazing things that have happened in the last couple of years for you is the popularity and success and interest in what you've created at Lankan Filling Station, has, has has the interest and success of it um, and understanding of it surprised you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I like I feel like it's been well received, and it's but it's always very bewildering when you stand in a restaurant and you have quiet nights and you go, "Am I doing the right thing?" And then someone goes, "Oh, it's the best meal I ever have," and you go, "Oh, that's excellent!" And then you get a review where it says the portions are small and it's too expensive and then you go oh. and then the next day you have someone say it's so authentic it's like my grandma used to cook and then someone else goes oh, it's Sri Lankan food for white people um so it's a topsy-turvy world I don't know if anyone sits back and feels I certainly don't ever sit back and go wow I'm so popular and my restaurant's so good um I think in a day you have I certainly have moments where I waver between I love my restaurant, it's amazing and the best and, oh, my God, we're never going to survive. And that kind of happens on a daily basis. So, But I think the fact that we're still there um, gives me hope. Well, it's amazing what you've created there. Um, I've, it's one of the things I miss about not being in Sydney anymore, actually, is, is, is your food and what you've created. Um, what is it that you love about what you do? Well, I love all of it. I love cooking. I love making delicious food. I love I love restaurants. I love that feeling of um, being in a restaurant and, you know, welcoming people and having that buzzy feeling of people eating and drinking and being happy. I love that whole thing about hospitality and how, you know, you can make make... <laughs> someone have a beautiful meal or a beautiful night and a beautiful experience. Um, yeah, I love all of it. I love working with good producers and talking about nice food, like talking about nice produce. I love the – I've even been doing a lot of floor shifts and I won't go as far as to say I love it, but there's something nice about it. <laughs> you know, it's been an, it's been really good um, – I'm not going to take it up as a career, but I love, you know, it's fun being on the floor and talking to the people and explaining the people. And, the, I mean, the thing for me that's really great is, you know, this interest in Sri Lankan food and being able to explain it to people and go, look at this, and then have people respond positively and go, oh, wow, it's really different to anything I've had or it's really delicious. Like that's, you know, that's quite a privilege to be able to, show people something that they've never had before and for them to enjoy it. I think that's, you know, that's pretty special. And I love having a team of people who I work with, not all the time because sometimes they're pesty, but having a team of people who, you know, you can work with and work together and who get excited as well um, for this for this project is, it's really fun. I just love it. 
Well, Tama, it's an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear a bit of your story. Lunker Food is out now on at all good bookshops. Um, please keep in touch and we would love to catch up again soon. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>